Fireside Chat. Uh, we're joined today by CZ, the CEO of Binance, of course. And uh, we were joking a little bit backstage uh, about, about how we introduce our, our, our guest today. And uh, <laughs> I was joking with Alex, our producer, and he sort of was saying, uh, do we even give this guy an introduction? But uh, we're very honored today to be joined by uh, none other than Mark Cuban. Uh, Mark, how are you? I'm great, guys. How are you doing? Good, good. We're doing well. Good, good, good. It's, an honor, it's an honor to have you here, uh, Mark. Yeah. yeah, you guys set your sights higher. No honor at all. <laughs> 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 well, well, let's try to get through this first before we uh, before we see about that readjustment. Awesome. Sure. Um, well, we're here today to talk. We're here today to talk uh, crypto, DeFi, NFTs. Uh, you know, I think I think uh, Mark, you've been making the round the rounds recently in uh, various sort of crypto outlets. And so uh, we're happy to talk to you today about some of your, your various pursuits in the space. Uh, how yeah. have things been going for you? I mean, it's a learning process. I mean, you don't just walk in and know everything. So like anything else, um, it takes time. Um, there's a lot of things happening in the space, obviously, not just, um, I mean, well, in each of those spaces, right? They're all different in their own way and they're all connected in their own way, whether it's DeFi, NFTs, um, just basic blockchain applications, smart contracts, you name it. Um, so I'm here learning my solidity and, and just trying to figure it all out. That's awesome. That's awesome. Have you been uh, have you been doing much? Uh, have you been diving in on the development side? You talk about solidity. Yeah, I used to write software way, way, way back in the day. I used to write distributed database applications. And so, you know, I have a fundamental understanding how it all works. But, you know, it, it's changed a lot since then. So just trying to to get my arms around how, how smart contracts work, what's um, what's fungible and what's permanent and, you know, what, what variables are there and all that kind of stuff. So I can get a better business understanding of applications. Very impressive. I think you, you already know more about blockchain than me. I actually don't really know how to do solidity programming. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to, we'll have to have the two of you in a hackathon just to see. No, uh, <laughs> who writes more bugs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, no, you know, it used to be back in the day, you could just start programming and your fingers did what your mind wanted it to do. Now I have to look to see everything, you know, and every semicolon and every bracket and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, my programming days are over. And um, the solidity programming is actually very high risk. If you have a bug, um, there could be millions, a lot, of, a lot of money at stake. So um, it's actually very, very tricky. Yeah. Well, so, anything, uh, yeah. Any compiled, when I would program, any compiled language was a problem, right? So, <laughs> you know, it, it always lots of hours trying to debug. Cool, cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks again for, for being with us today. Uh, I guess, uh, do you mind going a little bit into your background, Mark, uh, for or a, as it relates to the crypto space? I mean, uh, uh, we, we have some sense that you're actually not new to the space. What is your... What is your journey with crypto? Been like? I mean, back when Coinbase opened up and, you know, I've always let me take a step back. I've always been a tech guy. You know, I had a systems integration company that I built. And like I said, I wrote software, did distributed database applications. Um, and so that gave me a fundamental understanding of everything that was going on. And so when crypto hit, um, you know, I probably 2012, I think, is when Coinbase got started. And that's when I downloaded it. Um, and started messing around with it. And, and people would just send you some Bitcoin. People would send you this or that. And, you know, then with Ethereum hit um, 2012 or whatever, I don't remember, 2010, um, you know, started just um, messing around and trying to understand that. And honestly, my orientation always was kind of conflicted with, um, with crypto because I never saw it as the potential of being a currency. You know, I, I saw it being a method of exchange. I, you know, I, I understood blockchain and like I said, I did distribute a databases, so I saw the value there. Um, but, you know, I would always give people shit and because everybody was saying, oh, you know, Bitcoin's going to be a, a currency. And, and I, I was never a proponent of that. Um, but what, you know, so and I just followed it and tracked it. And I, you know, I never really sold anything that people would give me, you know, as they would try to, you know, get me to pimp things out and, and promote things. And so I managed to accumulate some things along the way. And then I even took some flyers on some things and I bought some things along the way, some Bitcoin and Ethereum over the years. Um, again, stuff that I just all held. Um, and, and, you know, I would I would always get into battles with people that, you know, Bitcoin's not going to be a currency. It's not going to be a currency. And I still feel that way. Um, and then the whole thing went from it's a currency to it's a store of value. And, you know, and, and that's what I would always say. You know, Bitcoin is a store of value. 
no different than gold. It's worth what somebody would pay for it. It doesn't have a whole lot of utility. I'd rather have a banana if it came down to it, but you know, it, but it's still a store of value. And then what's really changed things is I got into um, messing more with smart contracts um, around NFTs. Then, you know, that's where things really started to, to really blast off for me when it came to crypto. Because with smart contracts, um, well, let me take a step back. So as I was reading and listening more about NFTs, more just recently over the last few months, I decided I went to Mintable.app and decided just to mint some things. And, and learn how they went. And I went to Rarible and I went to OpenSea and I went to others. And as I minted some things, you know, the minute I saw the fact that you could um, save royalties and, and store things, store a royalty, and I forget the, the, the standard for it, you know, but you could, you could save a royalty into the blockchain as part of a smart contract. That was the game changer in terms of me just diving in. Because what that meant was any type of digital IP could be monetized, tracked, and every time there was a resale, then um, the original creator could participate. And to me, that was the game changer that really opened up my eyes on, on NFTs in particular. And then you start digging in to see what the applications were and how they work. And, you know, you start getting into, you know, smart chains, binance smart chains and others and Ethereum and how layer one works. And like I said, I, I, I worked with networks for years. We were a systems integrator. So I know, you know, back when we started AudioNet, when no one was doing streaming and no one knew what streaming was, you know, we had to deal with layer one, layer two, layer three. We had to deal with um, different types of, of ways of presenting streaming and, and doing streaming across multi networks. And so I understood the whole layer one, layer two, three, four concept. And so I just started digging in and just seeing the rush of applications, the competition, the hype, you know, the, the challenges is, is interesting. But where there's interest, you know, you can start to see like just in the old like in the old days, you know, looking to write database applications to automate um, analog um, processes. That was one big step. Then you saw that move to the Internet. Then you saw it move to the cloud and to mobile. And now with blockchain, I think, you know, we're seeing a whole lot of underpinning on how these things could be applied there as well. And that's why it got me excited. Awesome, yeah. Uh, I, I, and I guess, CZ, you've been through several of this, these cycles yourself now. Um, you know, I, I think Mark talks about a lot of new uh, sort of applications and products and, and things built with blockchain technology. What do you think is different about this time? Um, I think well, I, what Mark just said is really eye-opening for me, to be honest. Um, so I'm actually so I'm really into crypto, as people, uh, everybody knows. Um, but I'm actually um, so I actually think Bitcoin is a currency uh, from the very beginning, and the smart contract part, uh, the NFT part, actually didn't. Uh, I wasn't that deep into it, to be very honest, because I'm busy with um, with finance. So that's a really interesting aspect uh, about like this um, this new industry where. Things uh, uh, things keep developing at a really breakneck neck speed, and um, different things attract different people. Um, so that's really really fascinating for me to learn. Um, and it's kudos to Ethereum for uh, uh, Vitalik for inventing smart contract solidity, etc. So I think Binance Smart Chain is really benefiting from from those inven inventions um, uh, uh, now. So from market cycles, look, market is always the market is always going to go in cycles. Um, there's going to be a bull cycle, bear cycle, etc. Um, and but I think uh, this cycle, every, but within within crypto, if, uh, if we look at the cycles, every cycle is very very different. Um, I think Mark got uh, got uh, got exposed to uh, crypto actually Bitcoin or much earlier than me. Um, in, uh, I, I I only learned about Bitcoin in 2013. In 2013, there was a Bitcoin. It's a Bitcoin market. There's this Bitcoin, and there's a lot of other what we call altcoins back then. But most of them did not survive. I think the only exception is probably actually Litecoin, uh, and Dogecoin started in 2013 or 14. Um, actually lasted. Um, uh, most of the other ones did not last till now. And Ethereum started. Uh, Ethereum started in 2013, 14. Um, and then become popular in 2015, 16, 17. So on the on the 2017 bull market, it was Ethereum, uh, ERC20 tokens. A smart contract wasn't that big of a thing. Well, ERC20 tokens rely on smart contracts, but um, uh, but it was like okay ICOs. Um, and this time around, in this bull market, there's so many factors contributing to it now. And um, um, there's like the well, this number one, the 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 the, the inflation, quantitative easing, um, the stimulus packages in in the traditional markets outside of crypto. Talk about that too, because I don't think I don't think this is a hedge to any of that, 
right? I think sure. it's completely independent, just like yep. gold, right? I mean, a lot of the perception of crypto tracks what gold has, the story behind gold, right? As a store of value, as an alternative to hedging, you know, yep. you know, and people say gold has intrinsic value and crypto does. Gold has no intrinsic value other than some basic <laughs> manufacturing applications. When, you yeah. know, people, people assigning high value to gold jewelry is no different than people yeah. assigning high value to any cryptocurrency, right? It's just, exactly. it's not, yeah. Yeah. it's not, yeah. a Exactly. So I think I think now people are understanding that. And this time around, look, we have uh, we have DeFi, we have NFTs, we have we have so much more. Uh, we have institutional treasury holding Bitcoin, um, and that's uh, those are huge, huge uh, pools of money that's coming in. So I think uh, each cycle uh, we will go, we'll still go through bull and bear cycles. Yeah, that's just how markets work. So, yeah. but uh, this, hey, this uh, is going to be but, a huge bear market in NFTs. And look, we saw this with internet stocks too in the early yeah. days of the internet. Everybody jumped in and it's really a spray and pray investment approach, right? Because you're trying to find out who the real players are. Um, and you saw that with early days, you know, now people will mint anything. And if you have a following, people will buy it, right? Yeah. Um, people will put out tokens. And if you can sell enough of them, you know, if you can hype them enough, then people will buy them. And just like you're seeing the tokens go way up and, and then, you know, they all kind of trade in, in parallel. Yeah. You know, the biggest difference between the early days of the Internet and when the Internet bubble burst and what's happening with tokens is is one interest rates. And two, it's a lot easier to hype a token than it is to hype a stock. Oh, you yeah. know, there, there's no SEC rules per se that that prevents you from from doing some of these things. And so um, it, it, you're right. CZ, there's there's going to be um, cycles and there's going to be big drops in a lot of these things. And at the end of the day, in my opinion, anyways, you know, the underlying technology will make a difference. And, you know, the principles in play of, you know, are they a good company doing smart things will, will make or break the company. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Um, actually, I, with that in mind, uh, we, it'd be great to dive into some of the sort of specific DeFi applications and, and NFT applications uh, uh, you've taken a look at so far, Mark. It feels like I looked at all of them, but there's still many more to go. Awesome. Awesome. Do you have uh, do you have favorite favorite components of the DeFi yeah, ecosystem? I don't, to, I don't want to really hype things at all because, you know, it, it, it's, it's interesting because, again, going back to the early days of the Internet, when I went on CNBC, I could watch the ticker. If I'm talking about stocks, I could watch the ticker yeah. and those stocks would be going up. And it's the same thing with tokens now with social media. Right. You know. People, I, I must have 20 wallets, right? And people, one of, you know, where I, um, where I minted some things, that's obviously going to be public. And, and so people look what I put in that wallet and that's kind of my hype box, if you will. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I try, you know, I, the things that I've already talked about publicly are Injective, um, MFT, Matic, um, what's the other ones? And then I'm in Ethereum and Bitcoin. Um, and then I bought some Phantom, but those are, those are in those wallets. So people are going to be able to see that public anyways. And then there's some other ones where I've invested that, um, I'm not ready to talk about yet that are in different wallets. So out of those six that you mentioned, other than Bitcoin and Ethereum, they were all Launchpad, Binance Launchpad projects. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, you guys invest in a lot. You guys do investing and Coinbase does investing by spray and pray too, right? So yeah. they all have these foundations and you give a little bit of money to everybody which kind of proves the point that it's hard to pick winners and losers yet. You don't really know which ones are going to take off because it's not just the technology side, but it's the marketing side. You know, you've got to get people to adapt. You've got to get people to develop. You've got to get people to, to, to accept them. Um, you've got to get people to trade them. And that, that's also the unfortunate side because, you know, which marketplaces um, or DEXs that you trade on has an impact on, you know, yeah. how, how people perceive a coin, which really doesn't necessarily reflect the underlying technology. And there's, you know, and at layer one, people are trying to do a whole lot of different things. And then, you know, better than most, you know, the battle between, okay, what's going to happen with Ethereum at level layer one versus, you know, the layer two trying to, you know, trying to amp up the transactions per second and dealing with those issues. Then there's sharding versus um, using all the different, um, multiprocessor, all these different issues that everybody's trying to make technological determinations about, but it's too, still too early, right? Yeah. This is the only business where you, 
you know, you kind of write an app, um, your own blockchain, let's just say a layer one application, and then you release a coin and you hype the shit out of it, not knowing if the application works or what the application implications are going to be, right? It's kind of a back-ass half-word approach to, to dealing with technology. And so that's part of the challenge is because no matter what it is, the hype level is always up here because it almost has to be. And yeah. then, the, you know, the installation, um, the execution side is down here and it takes years to find out. Um, that's pretty much what happens to BNB. Like we, we we launched it, we hyped it, we sold it first before we had a platform. So, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. It, it's crazy. Like you get you get people who you get influence influencers, right? Who had no yeah. understanding of technology whatsoever, right? Yeah. Putting out talking about different tokens and it has nothing to do with the actual application itself. You know what? You know what's going to happen? You know, and so. Because writing layer two, layer three, layer four stuff is no different than writing any other software, right? And and you're trying to look at applications. But the good news is, you know, we're going to see a lot of applications that were SaaS applications in corporate America be moved over to the blockchain. And that's going to be very disruptive. And we're still seeing how to figure all that out. You know, you're still trying to see... You know, like Zen, you know, Zen or Zendesk or um, Twilio or whatever. Pick any application that's multi-billion dollar stocks that can you replicate them and do a better job and simplify it on the blockchain. You know, look at NFTs. There's no, you know, the whole college textbook market, right? That all should be digitized and on NFTs. Is it big enough for someone to walk in and buy McGraw-Hill and say, you know what, we're done doing this old physical book thing. It's crazy that people take notes in a physical book and then take it to a used bookstore or ship it off to a, a website that then exchanges it for money or whatever. That's, you know, 1937 technology. And, and so why aren't all those digitized NFTs when you're done with the book, you know, your digital version of the book, you just sell it, right? But the good news is the original publisher gets to share in the resale value. Those are all the changes that are going to happen. And so what I'm looking for is the fundamental technology underneath it that allows me to say, okay, these are the guys that are going to be the winners in this application, this application, this application, and just try to ignore all the hype, even though it's fun to speculate, right? doesn't matter if it's a Top Shot, a BMB, you know, Matic, you know, INJ, that's all fun. You know, doggy coin, like I tell my son, um, you know, it's all fun, but um, it's real money. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And actually, I guess, uh, Mark, as you think about uh, kind of the, the current state of applications and, and kind of what's appealing to you, uh, what do you, you know, what do you see as the things that could be improved or, uh, uh, you know, how do you think we get to, to that next level? Um, well, first, there's this push pull between Ethereum and everybody else. Right. And so everybody, so there's a race right now and you, you Susie, you know this better than anybody, right? The, yes. What scalability? No, I, I don't know anything about it. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing at all, right? No. Nothing at all. Um, you know, so scalability matters because a lot of these applications are going to be dependent on can you scale? And, you know, some people that live Ethereum, 2.0 is going to make it work. Others say layer two, we can work around it and we'll bridge, you know, you guys have with smart chain say, you know, look, on one hand, I see what you're doing and it's smart in that with smart chain, just bring every application, right? Something's going to stick. It's a numbers game. So you just throw everything at it and you hope something sticks and then that scales. And then, you know, you're very big on messaging and that's important too, because perception is reality. And so you see this, you see this, you, you know, I see all kinds of shark tank type marketing things with, with what you guys are doing with, with um, BSC. Right. And, and so, but, that's that's part of the push pull trying to figure out you know will can there be multiple players i think there'll be multiple players right will all the layers evolve so that you you can they can coexist yeah the the layers will evolve so they can coexist um just like there's different codecs you know when you do video just like when you do artificial intelligence there's you know, there's multiple types of neural networks. There's GANs, there's CNNs, right? There's reinforcement learning. There's all this stuff that, that applies. You know, I do a lot of computer vision stuff. And, and so, you know, 
there, there's going to be multiple winners, but we're it's still so early in this race that everybody's trying to grab all the markers that make them look really powerful. Um, and that's part of the challenge. Yeah, I think awesome. I think I think Mark Mark, Mark mentioned the, the 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 real challenge I I saw as well, which is um, so I define it a little bit simply, um, more as a scalability. Um, I think right now the the technology is good, uh, it's decentralized. Uh, we uh, I think the uh, the concepts work, um, it's proven, but for real ap mass adopted apl applications, we need to handle much larger volumes. Right now, most of the popular blockchains cannot handle that vol that type of volume. So I think um, uh, w w with Binance Smart Chain, we got really lucky. Uh, it just came out at the right time and when uh, ethereum is relatively congested and the fees are high um, but i fully adopt i fully agree with what mark said which is um um there's gonna be multiple players there's gonna be multiple dimensions as well they can they can be multiple layer ones multiple layer uh, multiple level zeros uh, layer ones layer two um so um there's gonna be a lot of different uh trial, trial and errors uh, we'll, we'll see how it turns out but basically um there is a bit of marketing there's a bit of hype but the, fundamentally we got to build products that people use yeah. yeah, you know, what you guys are doing with BSC reminds me a lot of the early days of the internet with, with streaming, right? So back <laughs> in 1995, no one knew what streaming was. You had to download yeah. a, a TCPI client. You had to have a 56K modem, believe it, remember those things. Yeah. And you, you had to um, download um, an audio player, right? So New you had audio. to do all these steps, right? And so yeah. it was a hassle, but the, the value proposition was there. But we had to prove that it could scale. You know, and yeah. so we would put on these bigger events and bigger events to try to get, you know, with audio, we would get 50, 60, 100,000 simultaneous listeners, which was no problem. But as you got to video, you know, to try to get 10,000 simultaneous viewers, even if it was just post stamp, that's that was hard. So you had to do proof of concept things to show that you could scale yeah. the network in order for people to have confidence to do business on it. And so I see yeah. a lot of the similarities with what you're doing there. And, you know just trying to get those TPS numbers up high and you guys like to brag about them. And that's smart, right? Because, and you know, because there is an application somewhere, you know, that says, okay, how am I going to decide whether or not I'm going to use BSC or I'm going to use Ethereum? Do I wait for 2.0? Do I use Matic? Do I use, you know, near, do I use in, you know, whatever. Right. And, okay. and so, or um, with Solera, Solana, I forget, I, I'm Solana, still learning. Yeah. All, right. Um, yeah. and, and so, you know, trying to make those business decisions because the real, because right now we see, we, we look at the price of a token as reflecting the success of the underlying um, applic application, right? Yeah. And that's not really the way it should be, right? Mm -hmm. That's again, back ass half words. And so yeah. we play out all these hype games are, going, are being played. And like I said, it's fun to track the value of BNB versus this versus that, right? Versus Ethereum. And we use that as reflection of the quality of the underlying technology, but it's not, right? Mm. And that's part of the challenge is right now because longer term, the winners are going to be the ones with the best technology that can enable the most applications and be the most disruptive. And at its heart, you know, blockchain is incredibly disruptive. Smart contracts are incredibly disrupted, yeah. particularly because they're public and, you know, we don't need to rehash, you guys all know that. And so, I'm trying from my end as an investor, as someone who likes to, to fuck things up, to disrupt things, I'm, I'm looking to see where, where the best places are to say, okay, you know, you guys talk about the price of tokens, that's all noise, right? You know, not, you know, the money's real money, right? When you talk about the multi-billion dollar valuations and everybody in this industry does the exact same thing that we did back in the early internet days when we were public, which is mark to market. Right. I own this many tokens. You know, what's how much am I worth today and all that kind of stuff. And that's human nature. But three years from now, four years from now, when to your point, CZ, all that market has gone up and down and, you know, beer market, bull market and all these different cycles, great technology will be sustained and there will be yeah. applications written on them that change the game. And that's really what I look for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, uh, I talk about price a lot. Well, not, number one, because it actually helps our business when people care more about price because it sure. creates more trading activity. Um, but I, and also a little bit, as you mentioned earlier, a little bit of hype at the beginning is actually quite important to bootstrap the value of the coin, which actually gives the project more resources to work with, uh, then more funds to hire developers, and et cetera. You keep, on, you keep on issuing coins, right? And you get to pay yeah. you know, your APY, you know, yeah. and it, it, it's kind of crazy. 
But let me just yeah. remember, remind everybody of this. You know, one of the best lines ever, the, the risk does not leave the system, right? Yeah. It gets pushed around a lot, but it yeah. never leaves the system. And yeah. so, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, totally. Um, and actually, yeah, you 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 preempted uh, a question I was going to ask. Uh, you know, I think there's uh, obviously a lot of comparisons that get made between kind of the early internet and kind of the the, the current crypto ecosystem. Um, are there other you know are are there other like comparisons you see and and you know e either either really you know really stark similarities or really stark differences? Like uh, maybe what's what's different about it this time too? There's not a lot of different about it. I mean, the the biggest <laughs> difference is the SEC. Right. Because most of the Internet um, and the ensuing Internet bubble was done through public companies. And effectively, um, there's tokens are not equities at all. And I'm not suggesting that, but they're tradable. Right. They're tradable assets that that go up and down in value. And when something can go up and down in value and people want them to go higher, they're going to hype them and they're going to play games to get those prices up there. And, you know, the fact the way DeFi is working, excuse me, there, there's, a, there's a lot of amazing things to DeFi. I love DeFi because, you know, every Bitcoin, every Ethereum that you own, to use those two as an example, not, not to exclude BNB, but, you know, but those two in particular, you're a bank, right? And you can lend, you can borrow, and it's decentralized if you do it right so that you have a lot of power and the friction is reduced considerably versus traditional banking. And, you know, when it comes to um, exchanging value with somebody else, it's easier than Venmo. It's easier, you know, because there's nobody, it's not centralized, right? And so I think the impact there is is incredibly dramatic. Um, and you'll start to see societal influence as, as a result as, as this grows. And so while, you know, there's a, there's a lot of hype and a lot of this yield farming, I think, can be can be challenging and and scary, right? Because when you know the underlying factor, it, it when people are chasing liquidity, and and you guys have to deal with this. So tell me tell me if I'm wrong, CZ. I'm I'm still learning this, right? When you chase liquidity and trying to find balance, right? Because you're trying to get all the pairs lined up. If you don't have enough die, you've got to go pay to get die. If you don't have enough tether, you got to pay or other tokens, right? If you don't have enough BS um, BNB, I got to pay more for BNB. But yeah. the yield returns are in the tokens themselves, yeah. right? And so, you know, even though you set a limit, it's almost like the stock stocks that are, keep on giving out options and warrants, right? Yeah. Where even though your treasury has a limited amount, you're paying people to do this. And, you know, people underline just resell those tokens. And then that just they just go out into the the wild, if you will, and just increase the total number of tokens being exchanged. And that's not really creating fundamental value, right? Mm -hmm. That That's just trying to get money to move around. And, yeah. you know, you guys have dealt with that with what, what's it called? Pancake swap and syrup. Yeah. And you saw that shit, right? Just pancake <laughs> and syrup. <laughs> it cracked me up. <laughs> but, you know, so there's a lot of shifting money around and a lot of chasing money. And it's a game of musical chair, chairs at some level, with, you know, right? And, and so when somebody can't pay the toll or somebody can't, you know, when you get tokens who aren't exchanged, then it's yeah. going to be a problem. So what I think is going to happen, I'd be curious what your thoughts are. I think new tokens are going to have to bank. They're going to have to put up, you know, stable coins to say, you know, for and maybe there, it's happening already. Binance, I need for you to change the, to to do swaps on this. And so I'll put up a million um, stable coins, you know, tethered to the USD and um, you'll trade this for me. And as long as everything mm -hmm. works, I'll make up your deficit. Are you guys starting to see that at all or do you just do it based off of volume and interest? So uh, so there's a couple of points you mentioned there which are quite interesting. Um, so I, I fully agree with the fact that uh, I think DeFi will stay, the liquidity pools will stay, but the token incentives, the new token incentives with high APYs, I always said that that's not going to last. Um, I, I think you put it in a different way. It's just sort of pushing money, pushing risk uh, into different places. So um, and um, 
uh, there will be a few projects who can uh, last, who can who can get users, and then they will have lasting value, and their tokens their tokens will have value. But that's uh, they may have bootstrapped themselves from using a token to be an incentive to get some more users. But fundamentally, just giving high APYs uh, on new tokens doesn't doesn't work uh, in the long run. Um, and on the um, on the, on the uh, so we have a concept which is basically what you described. Um, on Binance.com, uh, for the projects that we're not so certain, uh, for especially newer, higher risk projects, we actually ask the project to make a security deposit with us before we list them. So, right. uh, so this is not a listing fee. We tell we tell them, look, there's a few conditions. If you don't trigger them, we return it. We return the uh, insurance deposit uh, over a period of time. Like, I mean, when you do that, you play. You you know, you're doing your own version of DeFi, right? And you've got yeah. to over collateralize the new token. It just yeah. makes perfect business sense. You got to do it. Yeah, so uh, so we actually do have that for some of the listings. Um, it depends, like some hot coins, like for example Uniswap, we we just listed it because it's a very hot project. Right. Um, but for for other pro for other smaller, less popular projects, uh, we're less certain, especially new ones. We do ask for it, and if their price drops significantly, we we uh, we, uh, we we can't, well we we take away the the insurance if they if the security hacks or if the security issues um, uh, uh, double spends or roll uh, rollbacks on the blockchain, we also uh, could suffer damages, et cetera. So we do have that concept, um, which is re it's really interesting that you are thinking at this level of depth. Um, so that's pretty interesting. Yeah. yeah and can, I always look at the money. I'm a shark, right? You know, yeah, yes, you I, I always look, take the shark tank, um, Friday nights on ABC, by the way, um, yeah. take the, um, the, the shark tank approach, you know, how's the business going to work, right? Yeah. How, how is it going to sustain itself? And yeah. you can't take all that risk. It'd just be crazy. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. I'm going off script here a little bit, but uh, have any of the other sharks uh, explored crypto or, or the blockchain and its various I think applications? Uh, has Mr. Wonderful. I hate calling him that. Um, <laughs> I think I think he has some, um, but Kevin's not technical. You know, there, there's different layers. Some people just trade to trade because they like to trade anything, right? You know, they're, they're gamblers that by nature or they're investors who just follow momentum plays. There's technical investors, and I think Kevin's more of a technical investor. Interesting. Totally. I, I feel like the the NFT based royalties and stuff. I feel like that would be with his uh, with his, his desire to structure deals. That might be his thing. I still have to explain what you know digitizing IP is, right? But once he gets that, he will, right? Because to me, it's such a game changer. You know, think of it not so much in terms of artwork or music or photography. But think of it in terms of every piece of information of IP that a company owns. You know, you could publish a patent there and set it up to be licensed and convey different rights. You can, you know, you could take um, whatever type of work you've done within your organization and, and publish it onto the blockchain and, and let people buy it and see value there. Things that don't have a way to be monetized right now can be monetized. And now, now the market still has to grow. Otherwise, you've just got, you know, there's, there's just no buyers. But once people recognize that it's a better way to exchange IP in a lot of respects, I think a lot's going to change. Yeah, and once once those uh, once those people realize and move those uh, new use cases into blockchain, the industry will have to grow because the the price will have to go up to uh, represent that, those type of uh, larger yeah. uh, larger value. Be part of it, right, that'll be the interesting part, right? Because mm -hmm. the tokens themselves don't necessarily have to represent the underlying technology, right? That's yeah. a fundraising mechanism more than anything, right? Yeah. So yeah. if I'm if I'm selling something on the Let's just say I'm putting um, transcripts, academic transcripts from a high school on the blockchain yeah. because it's just easier. I can charge, you know, in any type of digital coin, right? And most likely I'm going to do it on a USD basis, you know, and a stable coin than I would trying to get someone to buy my own token, right? Because yeah. that creates its own complexity. So if I have, uh, I went to a Mount Lebanon high school, so I'm not going to have a Mount Lebanon high school token. There probably yeah. shouldn't be a high school transcript token you know, by, from the company who created that technology or created that application. Um, but I, I should be able to accept, you know, a stable coin or, the, you know, the most prevalent stable coins because people still, you know, in regular business are going to think in terms of dollars um, and fiat, not in terms of E, BNB or whatever coin are created. So I don't know necessarily that application usage is going to drive values of coins when it comes to, um, top layer applications, right? But at the same time, I can see, you know, 
in the interim as pe- it's a way for people to invest in those new technologies in, in, in anticipation. And I think that could be, and I hadn't really thought of this before, one of the other conflicts that's starting to happen as I look at investments, people just want you to buy coins you know, as the equivalent of being an, an investment or tokens as the equivalent of an investment, but it's not. Right. You don't participate in the equity. The, the tokens yeah. you know, may or may not do well, but the equity in the company, if the application does well, will. And so there's going to be a little bit of that conflict. And so will will it turn out where you get governance issues, um, revenue shares? You know, that'll be the interesting part to see how that plays out. If you're going to use tokens as a way of representing, quote unquote, you know, governance and ownership, then you're going to have to share some of the upside in terms of profit sales or whatever it may be. Yeah, I, I think that, that that brings a lot of really interesting uh, uh, models in because we now have crypto and uh, many of the projects don't have equity. So they just have tokens. And so yep. that's a also a really interesting aspect. Like how do you evaluate? Uh, how do you value those tokens? What formulas do you use? Um, I've seen a lot of different formulas, but none actually make that much sense to me. So that's a that's another interesting aspect. Yeah. Right. I mean, because how do you share? Right. Because a lot of them are created yeah. as foundations, so they don't have to deal with that. Right. Or nonprofits, so they don't have to deal with that. Um, yeah. But, you know, if they're going to write applications and they're going to try to sell those applications, people are going to it's going to require, you know, investment at some level and people yeah. are going to want to return. And yeah. like going back to what you said originally, CZ, you know, the, the boom and bust cycles of pricing, equity holders don't, you know, want to. And I can't call them equity because it's not equity, right? But yeah. people want some level of return that reflects the business underlying it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 um, in in the crypto case, uh, the way I view it is, uh, people want to see more more increased usage. The more users there are, the more valuable uh, that token well, is. Right now, yeah, because that's the way the game is being played, right? So yeah. here, here's the, like I wrote blog posts on blogmaverick.com years ago, fifteen years ago, and I said if you put 2004, I think I wrote a blog post that if you put a Mickey Mantle baseball card on your desk and you put a share stock on your desk that doesn't pay dividends, there's no difference between the two, right? No. All that matters is what somebody's willing to pay for it. And then and analysts for stocks and even people who trade baseball cards create narratives, right? You know, price earnings ratio. That's just a narrative to sell a stock, right? Yes. You know, um, you know, growth ratio peg, you know, pr- um, price versus um, growth, earnings growth. Um, those are just narratives, right? That people yeah. use to try to sell stock. You know, we use back in the early days of broadcast.com, we use visitors, traffic, right? And scalability of our network and amount of contact, just narratives to sell a stock. And it's the same thing now, right? TPS, right? Narrative, yeah. to, you know, to sell a token, right? Number of users, you know, get how many people can you get on your DM? Num- you know, just a narrative. Yeah. So we're in that narrative stage still, which is normal for the early days. That's really when you're when you're looking for these these markers to reflect value. That tells you it's still the early days of what's going on. So to your point, CZ, it'll be interesting to see how this transitions. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. And and Mark, in terms of what you know, I think we've talked quite a lot about NFTs. Like in terms of what you've done in the space so far, uh, I heard a story about you minting a. Minting a token on Rarible and and uh, what what sorts of uh, NFT adventures have you gotten in so far into so far? Um, yeah, I've minted a bunch of stuff where I've I've played with it and and sold them on um, Mintable.app and Rarible.com and OpenSea.io. Um, and so it you know I, I started off where I just took a GIF file of some of me walking into a Mavs game to go work out, and I put up um, ten of them. I thought I think at um, $25 each, whatever the, the equivalent ETH was. And I'm like, no one's going to buy this shit. And bam, not only did they sell, but they kept on being retraded. And I, you know, and I only set my um, royalty at, at 10%, I think at that point. And I was like, oh my God. And then I tried some other things. So I, then I created my own version of Cameo. Do you guys know what Cameo is? Cam, Cameo, is a, Cameo is an app slash site where, where celebrities, um, where you can go and ask a celebrity to record something for you. So okay. you can go and ask Mr. Wonderful, would you record, um, say happy birthday to my friend Sam and I'll pay you $500, right? Okay. So what I did, I said, okay, I'm gonna create my own version of Cameo. And so I created a little video that um, I minted, I think this one was on Rarible. And I said, if you buy this, and it was the equivalent of $2,500 in ETH, if you buy this, 
I'm going to unlock a special email address that I created specifically for this token. And you can send me an email and I'll customize a video just for you. And bam, sold them out in a heartbeat. And they even resold. And I think I, I sold all of them in, in 22 minutes. And I got some really cool um, videos that I sent out to people. And, um, and so, you know, just trying to experiment with different ways that this works. Um, I worked, um, I, and so in terms of just buying other people's NFTs, I bought one, um, Ellerbeat, I forget, it's a general um, generated music um, and art that I thought was really cool that also used the, um, the bond curve to um, set pricing and to set reserves. And they set the reserve at 90%, which meant, okay, I'll buy one or two of these because you know, there's a really good chance I'll get my money back if they sell these out. Um, and so I, I bought some of those. I bought a hash, ma hash mask um, simply because I wanted to see how the NCT works. I bought a bunch of top shots. But, you know, we can talk about Top Shots a little bit with Flow. Um, they obviously are having some of their scalability issues. And I, I don't know if it's the Flow that has trouble scaling or just, you know, the application itself. Because I think that they just got overwhelmed with, with volume, which is a high-class problem to have, right? You'll deal with that because you can fix that. Um, but it's interesting now because there's, there's so much heat around it that the prices for the Top Shots, when I got in, I was buying them all up for 2 and $3 each. Now the lowest price is $30 each. So it'll be interesting to see if – New kids coming in think that's too expensive or it's worth it. But the bigger picture is that, you know, collectibles um, from the NBA and other sports organizations, music, whatever, um, there is a market there. And the good thing about Top Shots that I think was just brilliant is, you know, you don't have to think in terms of a wallet. You know, you just bring your credit card. And you guys at Binance have tried to have done some of this as well, right, where you just you just all that matters and, you know, the K, they don't have to deal with the, the know your customer stuff, right? And, yeah. you know, and so because they're not dealing with um, financial assets per se. Yeah. And, and so, um, yeah, I'm trying to not learn too much about FinCEN, but I'm learning more than I, I wanted to. Um, and, and, and so, you know, it'll be interesting to see how that drives people to the market and what people do with Flow and whether or not, you know, they'll allow people to, to take, you know, um, and get access to the the moments they call them their NFTs on Flow. Actually, that's a really really fascinating story you just explained there. Um, I think a, 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 myself included, I actually have not uh, gone and minted my own NF NFTs. I received a bunch uh, and bought bought a few, yeah. uh, just playing with it. But that's a really fascinating uh, story, actually. I think, and also especially with a Flow and NBA doing their sales of N NFTs and you, you yourself selling NFTs, really giving. NF, F, NFTs a lot more exposure, and there's some really interesting use cases that have not been uh, really sort of uh, 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 executed. Um, like concert tickets can be NFTs because they're they're, they're one per seat, sure. and and then um, um, this uh, new idea which you actually alluded to, um, people are, uh, people in Japan are suggesting using NFTs as a uh, deposit voucher for uh, for exchanges, um, because again, as you said, selling NFTs is really easy to get a well, anybody can sell it there's not a whole lot of licensing around that um but they carry value right as you said they they, they represent value what what we could why could we use that as a deposit voucher um so a lot of those really interesting ideas are coming up yeah. um so yeah yeah it's interesting because anything that's perishable an nft can do better right any yeah. any yeah a ticket right you know you know something that if you don't use it you lose it whether it's an airplane ticket a sporting event ticket a concert ticket and, you know, there, there are a lot of companies that have been working on blockchain versions of ticketing. It's just a question of what's the best application of it and how do you integrate it with everything else that a, a concert venue or, or sports event um, venue does. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. And so one more sort of longer form question here before we get into uh, what, we, what we call our quick fire session. Sure. Um, but, you know, I guess we've talked a lot about applications tonight. We've talked about uh, uh, DeFi and NFTs. I think more generally, you know, uh, Bitcoin has hit a trillion dollars in market cap. Companies are putting it on their balance sheet. Uh, Mark, from, from where you sit in kind of the business world, are you noticing a sentiment shift? Do you think it's, uh, do you think it's a meaningful, uh, meaningfully different sentiment shift? And, and uh, you know, yeah. how, how are people, how, how are people's, uh, perceptions of, of, of crypto and blockchain change from where you sit? It's not a shift, but it's it's an awareness, 
right? In other words, I don't see companies rushing to put Bitcoin or Ethereum or anything else, BNB or anything on their balance sheet, right? Not, not at all. Um, but I, I am having conversations uh, with people asking, why would Tesla do that, right? What is this guy at MicroStrategy doing and why? Um, why are they holding these things on their balance sheet? And, you know, then that eventually turns into a conversation about gold and, you know, how people perceive gold. And, you know, then that turns into a conversation, well, you know, should sovereign nations, you know, that hold gold sell part of their gold and move it into um, crypto? And honestly, I'd, I'd be all for that. Not all of it, right? But holding gold in Fort Knox in the United States of America is ridiculous. It has absolutely no impact, no value whatsoever, except kind of, you know, just like you guys, you know, on your BNB probably treasury a lot of, of BNB, right? You know, because it, it kind of reduces the outstanding float. Um, so I haven't got a lot of discussions there at all. Where I've tried to push discussion is rather than people treasuring um, um, Bitcoin or whatever is understanding the impact of smart contracts on their business. Because if you can show a company that they can become more efficient by using blockchain and smart contracts and reduce their cost and, and hassle factors and reduce friction, then that'll take them in the direction of understanding the value proposition. Like CZ said, um, on a, a variety of tokens and seeing where, you know, the, the play with tokens, if there is one for them. Um, but more importantly, understanding it, introducing the applications into their businesses to become more efficient. That's one applica That's one thing. The other part is using DeFi for corporations, right? You know, if you just set up a wallet and you buy some crypto, and you you know, even though it's over collateralized, that's typically not a problem for you know a decent you know even a bigger small company, right? You know, 10, 20 million or more in sales up to huge companies. And so if you, you know, where I've tried to move the conversation is not to treasury it, but, you know, even a big company, like even me, right, if, with, if, if there's a bank that I have a big account with and I want to borrow something for a mortgage or whatever, I still got to talk to somebody. I still got to deal with it. And then they're going to have to, I have to DocuSign stuff. And I'm trying to convey to um, entrepreneurs um, and CEOs, big and small, that just by holding some of this crypto, and using DeFi, you're good, right? It takes you 15 seconds and, you know, you can borrow up to 50% and you're set, you know? And once you build and build and build, you can go see CZ and he'll let you, you know, your collateralization rate will be even higher, right? He'll work <laughs> with you, you know? And then that leads it into how do you collateralize and how do you um, DeFi against your receivables? Because it'll be cheaper doing it that way. So you know, that's really where the conversation is starting to occur. How do you implement these things to really monetize IP with NFTs? How do you start using smart contracts to change your processes? Because can you can you become more efficient and friction free? And then finally, using DeFi within a corporation. Now, if you look at it that way, as opposed to just, you know, you know, because Elon is Elon, right? And Michael Saylor is doing it his way. And, and you know, kudos to him when it works. And, and so um, for everybody else, it's got to make business sense and it's got to, to really have an impact on their operation. And I truly believe, look, and I've been through a lot of wholesale changes, right? I, you know, like I said, in the early days of PCs, when people didn't think they needed PCs to being one of the first local area network and wide area network integrators, when people didn't think they needed to connect them locally, let alone globally, to the internet, to mobile, to you name it. Um, this is gonna have just a big an impact, but you've got to convey the applications from a business perspective to show the impact it'll have in this business. Because once you can prove that it'll impact their, their um, efficiency, their productivity and their profitability, it's over. That's when, so to answer your question, Colin, it's not so much looking at um, Tesla and micro um, um, MicroStrategy and saying, they did it. That's pretty much meaningless, honestly. Look, it creates demand and all hodlers love it because anything that creates demand makes the price go up until a whale sells and you get flash crashes like we see now. But the underlying principle that's critical is if we introduce crypto and smart contracts and blockchain, regardless of who they are, whose they are, into corporate America and companies start getting 
productivity and profitability advantages and competitive advantages over other companies because they're doing this. That's what changes the game. All the other stuff is just mishigas, right? It's just stuff, right? It, 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 it's just trading and it's just talking and it's narrative and it's fun to a certain extent. Um, but it's not really the truly impactful stuff. And I'm involved in this, not because, hey, let's see if I can make some money hyping and trading and this and that, but more because I see the intrinsic value and the corporate value and the fact that it can be disruptive. And that's what gets me excited. And that truly is the conversation I'm trying to have now with um, C-suite executives. Yeah, it's, it's really fascinating listening to you, Mark. Uh, and um, I, I've done a session like this with uh, Microseller as well. And you guys, it's interesting that you guys actually focus on very different parts of the crypto ecosystem. Uh, Microseller is very much a Bitcoin bull, uh, just a corporate treasury um, management, which I still think is valuable and meaningful. Um, you guys, but you guys are focused on very, very different parts. But I, I believe both are uh, both are very valuable. Both are really, really interesting. Well, so but, yeah. Why do you, th you know, because again, the, the big part of crypto I disagree with is the fact that it's a hedge that, you know, it's against, you know, um, an inflation head. There's no correlation whatsoever between what the dollar does other than if people buy more, right? Mm -hmm. If there's more dollars out there, maybe they'll buy more, you know, but if interest rates go up, you know, if interest rates were 6% right now, crypto would be lower, you know, because you mm -hmm. could, you could get, you know, risk-free money sitting in your bank account, you know? And, and so I think, and not just crypto, but stocks as well. You know, and and so, you know, to me, all this discussion about it being a hedge, you know, fiat is going to just, you know, is going to be destroyed and, you know, all this. Nah, you know, crypto works because it's a great application for certain things. And it's it's it can be it can be it can have a ubiquitous impact in in corporate America. Right. It can have DeFi can have a ubiquitous impact to making finance easier and better for everyday citizens. Crypto can have an impact with decentralization to making things fair. Crypto can have an impact because it can take people who otherwise can't get appreciable assets and allow them to get depreciable, um, appreciable assets, I'm sorry, they can otherwise can't get appreciable assets and allow them to get an appreciable asset that's been fractionalized into Satoshis or whatever it may be right? Um, and to buy one one hundredth of a Bitcoin or BNB or Ethereum. Um, and that's not something that you can do otherwise. And to me, those things are all game changers. And the whole narrative about it being a hedge to inflation just doesn't hold at all. Makes a great story. Okay. Yeah, okay. makes a great story, right? And I can see why people want to do it. Um, but, you know, I, I just... To me right now, and maybe history will prove me wrong, right? Maybe we'll see as inflation increases, people put their money into um, to crypto and all those prices accelerate, which by definition is, a, you know, inflation. Um, but I don't think this has any significant advantage because there's, you know, contractual limits to, to um, contractual scarcity. Yeah, I, I actually do sh do have a slightly different view on that. I, I do believe Bitcoin is a better form of money. Uh, and just because of that, uh, you will have uh, the intrinsic uh, ability as a uh, safe haven asset. Is, uh, but safe haven or not, that's just safe haven it has to be related or benchmarked to something else. But for me, um, like even just Bitcoin, crypto, like I'm not a Bitcoin maxi, uh, maxi but um uh, Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency has some advantages. Uh, the, the, uh, Bitcoin is, 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 itself, is, especially, no, it's is just a better form of money. You can weigh and transfer value, right? Yeah. It's far better than fiat, right? Because of every, but because of all the friction that the system yeah. introduces, right? But yeah. that doesn't make necessarily make it a hedge, right? So yeah, so when, if you want to transfer, you know, value to somebody around the world, Bitcoin, Ethereum, whatever, far better. Not even close. Yeah. You know, but if you just want to hodl thinking this is the ultimate inflation hedge, it's great when inflate when interest rates are low. We have yet yeah. to see what happens when interest rates are high. Yes, uh, that's true. So well, I, I guess we'll find out <laughs> if that happens. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll know when we know, right? Yeah. I think we lost our moderator. Um, Colin, you still uh, there? I, yeah, I'm here. Can you guys uh, hear and see me? 
Yeah. Oh, uh, your, your video is frozen, but we can still hear you. Um, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, that, that's that's the uh, that's the only part you need anyway. So, yeah. um, I guess we do have a a couple community questions here. Cool. Um, would love to would love to to get your take there. So the first sure. one, and, and I think we kind of in this last uh, piece of the discussion, we kind of circled it, and I think uh, Mark, you referenced it early on. Um, but uh, uh, at Rabindek uh, asks. Will cryptocurrency ever be mass adopted as a tr uh, transactional currency? Uh, uh, what should we? What? Should yeah, I'll, I can answer the question. Yes, we look out for okay. as a global market uh, as global market disruptors coming out from crypto. So the part I heard, sorry, I, I dropped you a little bit there, Colin. But so cryptocurrency depends if you want to have a sovereign digital coin and call that cryptocurrency, right? Will 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 there be a USDC issued by the Treasury? Yes, just like you're seeing in China and other places as well. Why? You know, I don't and also realize, let me take a step back. Ninety nine percent of, of transactions right now are digital anyways. Right. Yeah. You know, you're not handing physical money anywhere. Credit cards are all digital. Right. It's just that there's a lot of friction because of the way the system, the legacy of banking has been set up. And so going to a USDC issued by the Treasury makes perfect sense. Right. And so. That's why I don't think Bitcoin, that's another reason why I don't think Bitcoin per se is a treasury, even though to CZ point, I do agree, it's easier to transfer. But once we get, we'll have to get to USDC because look, it costs more than a, a penny to make a penny. It costs more than a nickel to make a nickel. It costs more than a quarter. And, you know, making dollar bills and dealing with all that, it'll just, we'll get to the point, maybe 10 years, maybe 20 years, maybe 50 years. I don't know when. But we'll get to the point where it's a lot more efficient. And plus, now with the pandemic, you know, people don't even barely even want to use cash. Nobody wants to use cash. You know, it's it's scary when when you have to pull a dollar bill out of your pocket and get change from somebody at a store. Nobody wants to do that. So USDC makes perfect sense as a as a sovereign issued digital coin, and I absolutely think that'll happen. Hmm. Cool. Totally. I kind of agree. Um, oh, yeah. Sorry, CZ. Go ahead, Colin. Awesome. Um, one more. Uh, yeah. One more from, from the. Oh, you've gotten better looking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it's okay. I'll. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I'll. I'll just switch to audio for 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 the time yeah, being. No, um, no worries. Yeah. Uh, at Lulu Kit asks. Uh, what is your take on blockchain gaming and the incorporation of NFTs into gaming? I think uh, that's actually. Uh, certainly a hot category we, we maybe haven't yeah. touched on just yet. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, video games have used tokens for years, just, you know, call them different things and, and you know, cashless currency for years. You know, it, it might be Fortnite gold, it, it might be whatever. And, and so that it, it's a given that it'll be used. It's just a question whether or not the biggest publishers want to, you know, go to blockchain and they'll make that decision based off of whether or not it's more effective for their company or not. If they can continue just using gold, which has has a big burn rate, you know, so if Fortnite keeps on just using, you know, their own currency, the burn rate is huge, right? Because it's not really tradable after the fact, which means they, you know, they make, it's like a gift card, right? What's not spent, they keep, even though yeah. on their balance sheet, they might have to deal with it differently. It's still cash in their hand. And so it really comes down to the business case more than anything else. Yeah. And I think at this point is similar with our air, airline miles, air miles. Um, so there's so much unspent air miles where if they bring it also the blockchain, they may be a huge cost in, in that sense to the guys issuing it. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, the first ones who issue it do have that significant advantage saying, look, we're, we're the ones you, we're like, well, the, then they move that advantage to the, to the users, which is more, now is more transparent and everything. So I think it's going to happen sooner or later. Um, yeah. Don't, don't know who's going to do it first, but it's, 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 it's going to come. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, and I guess uh, as a as a final question from the community here to, to close things off, uh, SDub2019 asks, uh, Mark, why are you so passionate about things? Uh, what drives your passion? One, I'm competitive as shit, right? I just <laughs> love to compete. And, and you know, I when I started out, I was always the youngest, the youngest, the youngest. Now I'm not the youngest anymore. And so I like to, I'm really competitive. And I like to, to, to learn new technology. And when something gets me really excited, you know, I, I've been through a lot of disruption phases, right? Or disruption cycles. And I've seen where they've worked and where they haven't worked and what's worked and what hasn't worked. And it took me a while for, it took a while 
from my perspective for the smart contracts and the layer ones or layer zeros to, to really start to take hold. But now that I see them and now that um, we're seeing applications that really enable them, um, it's exciting. And I think, you know, to CZ, CZ's talked a lot about, um, and I agree that we're in a proof of concept mode right now. Yeah. And part of the challenge is, you know, it's not mainstream yet. <clears throat> and you guys asked about that as well, right? It's not mainstream. There, there's a, a tight community and it, it's almost misleading because it's a global community. And here in the United States, we really tend to be, um, we not understand that what's global, we think it's all United States driven, right? When it's not, right? We, we, that's just how people here think. And, yeah. and so a lot of it, particularly here in the States, there's a long way to go. It's just tiny. It is yeah. tiny. And when you look at whether it's NFTs, whether, whether it's token purchases, we also look at social media. We get on Twitter, right? Or we go, you know, and you and you see all these people talking about it. And it's really misleading because it makes it seem yeah. like it's really big when it's really tiny. You know, yeah. and then you go on the Discord server or you, you know, and you see 350 people talking about it, right? It, yeah. It's relatively tiny. Um, yeah. And so there's a long way to go. And so that's why I'm excited because we, we barely scratched the surface. That's why I keep on, you know, um, making this the equivalent of 19, late 94, early 95 with the internet, because it's that same level of excitement. The people in the community got it, right? And we were all searching for new applications. In my case, you know, it was audio and video and everybody told me I was crazy. I can't tell you how many times I heard this internet thing, I mean, dude, I'll just turn on the radio. I'll just turn yeah. on my TV. I just got satellite TV. It's brand new, right? I can get it from anywhere. Um, you're crazy. You're wasting your time. And so when, it, when you're at that point, you're in there at the right point. The hard part is there's a lot of narrative and a lot of people trying to make money off the tokens. And I don't think enough people trying to understand the underlying applications and where they can be used. And as more and more businesses come in and the proof will be in what I said earlier, if companies in particular can find ways to change their business and compete better, it's over. Yeah. If individuals feel comfortable with D5 and we get out of the, the liquidity chases, right? And the yield farming chase, yield farming is narrative creation right now, yeah. right? It's liquidity chasing. And liquidity, to your point, CG, I, I can't agree more that that is not sustainable yeah. and that's going to be a problem. And so we've got to transition from that as quickly as possible to show yeah. people that DeFi is really personal banking. Yeah. That's what it is. And we've got to have better applications and make it easier to get fiat into the DeFi platforms, um, even with KY, you know, KYC um, and, and make it so simple that my 11 year old or 14 year old or 17 year old don't ask me about, we don't have a conversation about opening up a bank account for a savings account because, you know, for, for put aside what the, the interest rates are, you know, the negligible interest rates, but more because the lack of friction and the simplicity of it make it a better way to bank rather than dealing with the legacy bankers and the hassles that come there. You know, yeah. That, yeah. that to me is why it's so exciting and why I'm all in. Yeah, Mark. I, th I think I'm gonna quote you, uh, quote you on what you said there on Twitter. Um, DeFi is personal banking. Um, I think that's a great way to 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 summarize and conclude. And I think uh, um, anybody listening to you will, will understand your passion and your energy level, etc. I think having you in this industry finally, I'm really glad that smart contracts uh, brought you into this industry. You, you, uh, you love it so much. And um, yeah, I think having you in this industry now make this industry much that much stronger. So uh, yeah, thank you so much for. I think we're kind of up for time. Uh, um, I see it in the in the chat on the side, so um, yeah, thank you so much for uh, for, for for coming and uh, sh sharing with us. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, I'll be I, I'm I was already a fan. I'm a bigger fan now. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. I mean, I appreciate the conversation. Thanks, CC. Colin. If I need to help you with your bandwidth, I'll send you a couple tokens <laughs> so you can support a little better bandwidth. Um, appreciate but, yeah, it. Yeah, really, really fun. I learned a lot, and that's why I like to do these. You know, because every every time you know, I learned something. And so CZ, thank you. Colin, thank you. Um, everybody who was watching or listening, thank you. It was really enjoyable. And you guys can Cheers. follow me I'm on social and everything to see what I'm doing. I'm always M Cuban, 
whether it's on Rarible or Mintable or OpenSea, whatever, Twitter, that's where I'm always at. Excellent. All right, thank you so much, guys. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Mark.